Hello and welcome everybody and I'm very pleased to say this is actually a, this is a first that we're running a webinar with two experts so quite exciting and hopefully that it will it all works out okay we had a practice this morning so it should be fine so today um, webinar or the chat we're going to have is on ichthyosis so ichthyosis generally we're going to talk about along with talking about the um, X, I think it's called XLI. Is it XLI factor? Yeah. Yes. Which is really something I've never heard of, something that I think is really interesting. But most importantly, what I want to do is to do a shout out, first of all, to the Ichthyosis support group who very kindly have arranged this webinar um, and have introduced me um, to Professor Dello Tool and to Dr. William Davis. So very quickly, a bit of background about ichthyosis. It was founded by Mandy Aldwin um, Easton. And so for those of you who know the support group, I'm sure you very much will be aware of Mandy because she's incredibly active, incredibly passionate, and actually does have ichthyosis herself. So she can really understand and relate to the issues that ichthyosis um, does, um, I was gonna say does offer, or, or what happens when you live with um, ichthyosis. So ichthyosis is there to support and help you. And I do encourage everyone to go and have a look at their website. Now, one of the interesting things about ichthyosis is it's one of those things that either it's, um, it's a genetic condition, as I understand it, but I'm sure that I will be corrected when I get it wrong a bit later. Um, but it's very much about understanding that quite often it, a mild form of ichthyosis can be um, misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed as just dry skin. And what it isn't is dry skin as such. And what we're going to learn today is to understand more about the condition, how um, it presents itself, how we can um, manage it best, and also because of the slant in November, we always have on Talk Health, is very much around men's health. And this is something with ichthyosis, some people have this um, XLI link, which we're going to talk about later, which um, sort of goes off with a completely different pathway to normal dermatology um, issues. So what I'd like to do without ado is go ahead and introduce our um, great experts today starting with Professor Adele Tall. So Adele, can I ask you to introduce yourself and tell us all about yourself? Yeah, so um, my name is Adele Tool. Um, I'm an academic dermatologist based in East London. I'm actually Irish. I'm, I'm from the west of Ireland. And I went to medical school in Galway in Ireland. And then I trained for a bit in, in Ireland. And then I went to the United States, I did research there, and then I finished my training in the UK. And I've been working in Whitechapel ever since as a consultant, and I also do uh, laboratory research. And um, so I got involved with the ichthyosis support group quite a while ago, I think maybe about 2005 or so, uh, because I worked with a consultant at that time called Dr. David Page, uh, who at that time was the chair of the Medical Advisory Board at the Ichthyosis Support Group. Uh, and now I'm the chair of the Medical Advisory Board at the Ichthyosis Support Group. Um, so I see patients with ichthyosis of various types. Um, I'm also interested in palmoplantar keratoderma, which is a rare condition where you get thickened skin on the palms and soles. Okay. And Will? Hi everyone, so uh, my name is Will Davis, I'm a lecturer and a research scientist at Cardiff University in the UK in Wales. Uh, I did my first degree in biochemistry in Bath, beautiful city of Bath, and then did a PhD in behavioural genetics at Cambridge University before moving to Cardiff in 2006. Uh, I'm interested in all sorts of ichthyosis, uh, but my focus is mainly on excellent ichthyosis, and uh, my interest in that stems from some animal work we were doing a long time ago, in which we found some evidence that the steroid sulfatase gene, so this gene which is altered in X-linked ichthyosis, might be associated with uh, attention and problems with attention and conditions like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And that sort of got me 
linked up and interacting with the ichthyosis support group to look whether patients with X-linked ichthyosis were also likely to show attention problems. And since then, we've done various behavioral studies looking at uh, people with X-linked ichthyosis and also more recently, ichthyosis vulgaris, the most common type of ichthyosis. Well, thank you. And it, it is interesting, isn't it, this genetic connection and um, how it can go on um, af affecting people. Because, I mean, one of the things that is really coming out in dermatology full stop is the psychological effects of having a form of a, a derma problem, but never so much as what we're going to discuss today with the XLI link. And I just did notice the face group lady came up quickly in a chat. So there is, some, there is a link there also to the support group that I know that um, Ithiosis support group also are very interested working with that Facebook group. So um, Adele, can I ask you just to, to kick off really with an introduction to for people to understand what Ithiosis is, how and how it presents itself? Yeah. So um, ichthyosis is in general an inherited disorder, but it can be acquired um, and basically uh, affected individuals have dry scaly skin. Um, the commonest type is ichthyosis vulgaris, which occurs in about one in 200 of the population. Oh, wow. In ichthyosis vulgaris, you get uh, scales, usually on the arms and legs, generally worse in the winter. And it's commonly associated with uh, atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis. Um, patients with ichthyosis vulgaris also sometimes have what's called keratosis pilaris, where you get little bumps on the upper arms. And they also have increased lines on their, on their palms, palms of their hands. Oh, wow. Um, ichthyosis, extinct recessive ichthyosis is the, is the second... Uh, most common, and it occurs in one in 3,000 boys. And in X-linked uh, ichthyosis, the skin manifestations, basically you, in the first year or so of life, uh, scales become apparent uh, generally, first of all, um, on the arms and legs, and then on the rest of the body. But generally, they're more prominent on the arms and legs. Uh -huh. And you get quite dark brown, uh, small scales, small polygonal, so so with sort of almost five sides uh, shaped scales. Um, and basically ichthyosis, there are lots of other rare types of ichthyosis, some of which are, are more severe, but even ichthyosis vulgaris and X-linked ichthyosis in individual patients can be that there is a spectrum from mild to severe. So there can be patients that are more severely um, affected. Thank you. So, so when you've got ichthyosis, basically it, it, um, you, you've got dry skin. Uh, quite often you can be itchy. Um, some patients get pain or burning in their skin. Um, the patients generally are not able to shed the scales properly in their skin. So normally in the skin, um, the upper part of the skin, the epidermis, turns over every 30 days or so. Whereas in X-linked ichthyosis, which we're talking about today, the upper part of the skin, the stratum corneum, there's a problem there in that it, it just stays there. It isn't shedding properly. Um, so as a result of that, quite often patients have problems sweating and they can overheat. Uh -huh. So that's important, for example, in the, in, in, in the summer, if it's very, very hot, patients with ichthyosis have to be careful uh, to keep cool, drink lots of water. Uh, they have to be careful, a bit more careful when they exercise, etc. And on the milder forms, because when you were talking about the shedding, sort of made me think of psoriasis. And mm. the itching obviously made me think of psoriasis and eczema. Does it get misdiagnosed by doctors or, or, or are doctors aware of it? Uh, yeah, it can be misdiagnosed quite often, yes. So in, in general, doctors as a whole receive, so GGPs, for example, do not receive a lot of dermatology training, um, certainly in the UK. And that's probably because, uh, number one, we don't have a lot of dermatologists. Yeah. And number two, 
you know, only a small amount of time in, med in, in medical school is dedicated to dermatology, normally two to four weeks maximum. Although, you know, the average GP probably 15% of their work is or more is, is skin related complaints. Um, and occasionally, you know, patients can, you know, be quite a while with persistent scaling before the GP decides, uh, yeah, maybe it is ichthyosis, I refer to the hospital to see a dermatologist or to see a, a, a doctor with an interest in dermatology in the community. And um, so there can be a, a delay in, in diagno diagnosis. And actually, I, I just, in the last week, I just got the result of a genetic test back on a man who's had severe ichthyosis all his life, and he's now 52. So, you know, oh. And he, he was thought to have severe eczema. Oh. Yeah, yeah so, quite often. I mean, it is important to go to a dermatologist, isn't it? If you mm. can't, if you can't sort it out straight away, is to go to see somebody who really understands skin. But I guess that, uh, you know, a fair point is that eczema and psoriasis and ichthyosis all have in common that they're disorders of the skin barrier. Mm. All the, the way, that, how they occur is sort of uh, different. Mm, absolutely. Um, okay, well, what I'd like to do is go and have a look more and now sort of pick up on the theme of the XLI. But before I do that, I've noticed, I know I've, we've got lots of people chatting away there. Can I ask anybody who's asked a question in the chat, could they please put it in the Q&A session? Because that's all that I go and look at. At the end of the session, we'll have 15 minutes of asking questions. So that's what I go and look at. So please, could you put your questions into that section? Because then I can, I can read it through it quickly. Right. I feel like a bit of a school teacher there, honestly. Right. So, Will. Please tell us a bit about the XLI part of this. Okay, so X-linked ichthyosis is caused by uh, abnormalities in a gene on the X chromosome called, uh, the gene's called steroid sulfatase. So males only have one X chromosome, females have two X chromosomes. And this gene, steroid sulfatase, makes a protein which basically alters the steroids which are floating around in your body, which are important for various physiological processes, including uh, aspects of uh, skin maintenance, as Adele's already talked about. Okay. These changes in the steroid sulfatase gene can be specific to the gene themselves, which causes uh, loss of function of that particular gene, or most commonly, the uh, genetic changes are slightly larger deletions, which encompass the steroid sulfatase gene and a couple of genes either side of that gene. And the most typical deletion size is about 1.6 megabases. So that's 1.6 million DNA letters which are missing in okay. patients with XLI. Occasionally you can get even larger deletions than that. And there seems to be a spectrum of uh, severity of symptoms associated with the condition and basically it seems that the more specific the changes are to the gene the fewer symptoms you tend to get the larger mutations which encompass multiple genes uh, seem to be associated with more severe medical phenotypes so um, things like epilepsy autism uh, other sort of physiological problems Right, so these, these conditions that you're saying, they, when do these start presenting, or, you know, in what, at what, at that, what age? Uh, so some of the other symptoms which are associated with XLI, uh, they're known as extracutaneous symptoms, so things which aren't associated with the skin, include um, cryptorchidism, so that's failure of the testes to descend from the abdomen to uh, the scrotum, and that occurs pretty early on in development and they, that abnormality is often picked up quite early on in life uh, by uh, children's doctors and that's thought to affect between 10-20% of individuals, males with XLI. Uh, there's also other abnormalities of the eyes, so corneal opacities where the front layer of the eye is basically opaque uh, and that's present in up to 50% of individuals with XLI, but those uh, corneal opacities don't seem to affect vision to any great extent. Uh, 
There's also some evidence that males with XLI might be at increased risk of what are called atopic conditions. So things like eczema, asthma, hay fever, uh, allergic rhinitis, so nose constantly running, allergies, things like that. And we've also found some evidence recently that uh, middle-aged males who have these genetic changes associated with XLI might be at increased risk of heart problems, so heart rhythm problems, in particular a condition known as atrial fibrillation, where the heart beats irregularly. And atrial fibrillation is associated with potential complications, including an increased likelihood of blood clots, uh, heart failure, and stroke. Okay, and atrial fibrillation on the basis of our data, very limited initial data, suggests that uh, it might occur in up to one in 10 cases of uh, XLI in middle-aged males, whereas the normal pop the general population rate is about one in 40 males of that age. So when people present with these um, issues and concerns, do people attribute it to the XLI to, to the to that or do they just take it for oh well you've got a problem here so uh, well, some of these conditions there's a pretty well established link to xli i think for certainly the crypto orchidism and the corneal opacities i think that is links pretty well established now so if people get diagnosed with xli then those sort of aspects might be asked about uh, the link to the heart condition is pretty new and so there's probably a lot of people with XLI who aren't aware that this might be an issue and they might just be or well, scientists clinicians individuals with XLI might just be sort of joining the dots as it were and making links between having the skin condition and some of these other uh, problems and I mean I mean just sort of staying on the research side, I mean, it sounds like that there hasn't been loads of research or has there been lots of research into this area? Or is it just, you know, people are, as you said, just beginning to connect everything up? There hasn't been a great deal of research uh, into this condition in general. Most of the research which has been done has been focused on the skin. Uh, there's been very limited research looking at other organs outside the skin, really. Yeah. Firstly, because it's a rare condition, it's difficult to get funding into rare conditions. Um, and yeah, there just hasn't been the sort of imperative for scientists and clinicians to, to look at this. Yeah. And it's always the same, isn't it? And it's always a shame rather with rare conditions because the people that have the rare conditions, you know, it really does affect them on a, on a daily basis as well, doesn't it? You know, and we can see how prolific when we've got lots of people putting in chats here as so obviously very concerned about it and very aware of the issues and, and mm -hmm. concerns. Um, so Adele, just going back, so how do people generally present with a problem to um, a, a dermatologist? So with regard to X-linked ichthyosis, they generally present with, with dark scales on the arms, arms and legs. Um, Quite often, the scales are also also on the trunk. Um, generally, the hair and nails are not affected, and and the anterior part of the arm and behind the knees, um, just at the bend of the elbow and the back of the knee, are generally not affected. So that can be a clue that it's it's excellent ichthyosis. Also, it occurs in boys, and the scales are much darker than in ichthyosis vulgaris. So those are all clues that it might be X-linked ichthyosis. And if there's a history in the family of X-linked ichthyosis, generally it's diagnosed pretty quickly. Whereas if there isn't a history in the family, then it may take a little while longer to get diagnosed or decide it's, it's ichthyosis. Um, certainly if it's X-linked, it's a little bit more severe. I think most GPs would recognize that that is ichthyosis and would refer to dermatology. Um, some doctors, unfortunately, might have the attitude, you know, it's dry skin, it's not that important, there's no cure for it anyway, so therefore I won't refer to dermatology. So sometimes people might have to push a little bit to get a referral to dermatology. Yeah. So there's some evidence from um, prenatal screening studies 
that about one in 1500 males possess the genetic change associated with X-linked ichthyosis. Mm. But as Adele said previously, only about one in 6,000 males are diagnosed with the skin condition. So that suggests that only about 25% of individuals with the genetic change are being picked up in Yeah, so, so, so the instance is recorded as one in 6,000 births, but half are female, so it's one in 3,000 boys. But one, one in 3,000, yeah. that's, the, that's yeah. the suggest that there's a large that's still misses of, out some, yeah. of individuals who have the genetic change, but who aren't being diagnosed for some reason by dermatologists, maybe because their skin condition's mild, maybe because it doesn't mm. meet diagnostic criteria, maybe because it's being misdiagnosed as eczema or psoriasis. Or, or, or they're not referred to dermatology or, or not diagnosed, exactly. To dermatology. And mm. um, okay, can I ask a very stupid question? Is it just males or is can it be found in females as well? It's overwhelmingly overwhelmingly males wow. because it's an excellent condition and males just have the one x chromosome so they only need a mutation in one copy of their steroid sulfatase genes in order to uh have the phenotype yeah have this have the symptoms whereas females need a copy uh a mutation in both copies of their sts genes right so, because i do i i i just recall when we spoke that it it does sometimes present in females but very rarely. Is that the case or did I misunderstand that one? So females uh, tend to present as carriers, so they have a mutation on one of their right. SDS copies. Yeah. And that can be associated with a reduction of about half the level of steroid sulfatase activity in the bodies. So they might show sort of milder symptoms compared to the males. Um, so we've got some evidence that female carriers uh, might be at slightly increased risk of conditions like depression, of ADHD, of autism, relative to females in the general population. So they might show sort of milder versions of uh, symptoms which the males with um, XLI demonstrate. There, there have been cases uh, reported in females as well where the father was affected with X-linked ichthyosis and the mother was a carrier. Mm -hmm. So basically that they would get two, two copies of the affected gene. Well, that's uncommon. Right, okay. And so uh, presumably the sooner one can have a prognosis or diagnosis of the, of the XLI, then that allows you to start looking at other areas that might be a concern in the future for, for a for a boy, for example, is is that the case? It, you know, once it's by, do they go and diagnose it? Do you go and look for it? If you've got ichthyosis, do you go and have a look to see if you've got XLI as well? Or doesn't it work quite like that? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if somebody's referred to a dermatologist with ichthyosis, we have a look and we try and decide which type of ichthyosis it is. Right. So in, in general with X-linked, it's either ichthyosis vulgaris or X-linked ichthyosis. Occasionally it can be another disorder called lamellar ichthyosis, which might be the milder form, might look a bit like X-linked ichthyosis. But in general, it's trying to see if you can find, the, find out, either diagnose by examining the patient or by doing a test, um, what type of ichthyosis it is. So there are two tests that we do do to diagnose X-linked linked ichthyosis. You can measure the activity of steroid sulfatase in the blood, which is a very straightforward test, which is cheap. It costs about £20. Um, or you can do a genetic test uh, to look for a mutation in the steroid sulfatase gene or a deletion of the steroid sulfatase gene. So a deletion means just that the gene is deleted on the chromosome. So there's no steroid sulfatase gene there. Um, and occasionally you can get a bigger deletion where other genes are also deleted as well as STS. And those patients sometimes have more added complications. Yeah. So presumably then it is a good idea to really understand what you have so you can then look out for later development of 
certain areas where you may be susceptible to heart conditions, etc. Can I just ask so, Adele? So, yeah. so, can I just ask Adele? So if yeah. you have a patient who's got suspected XLI, are they routinely referred for one of these biochemical or genetic tests now, or do you not do that? Yeah, if I, if, yeah, if I, if I see somebody query X-linked, I would always do a test on them. Mm -hmm. Right. But funny enough, I was going to ask, but mine was obviously a far more basic question. You know, you have all this gene testing that, you know, is around at the moment. With one of those gene tests, would they be too basic to pick this up? You mean things like 23andMe or those sort of, where you can send off a sample of saliva in the post and you get yeah. it back? Yeah. In general, they probably would not pick them up. Um, but uh, so for example there's a the, there's been a big project on in the nhs called uh 100k uh genomes which was designed sort of to diagnose undiagnosed rare disease um and i know that some cases of x-linked ichthyosis were picked up there so they were obviously not thought to have x-linked ichthyosis by the person who, who referred them yeah. Okay, so moving on, so having been diagnosed um, with, you know, either with just, I say just, but with it and or with the link, what is the best way, um, Adele, in how to manage? Yeah, so basically patients with ichthyosis generally manage it with, with creams of various sorts. So the other part of management is, is exfoliation. So they would generally, um, you know, soak their skin and try and remove the scale in some way. Um, either they can use creams to help them to do that, or some people do things like add bicarbonate of soda to their bath, which seems like a strange thing to do, but it actually helps the scale to come off. Um, and then uh, they would generally apply moisturizers of some sort. Quite often those moisturizers would have something added in, for example, 10% uh, urea, which puts moisture back into the skin, or lactic acid, which helps take off some of the scale. Um, salicylic acid also helps uh, take off the scale. Uh, there are preparations available over the counter. So, for example, there's a preparation called dermal therapy, which contains alpha hydroxy acids. And some people find that good to remove scale as well. So it helps reduce the scale. In patients with more severe disease, sometimes they opt to uh, take a drug called acetretin, which is a drug which is derived from vitamin A. Um, also known as a retinoid, and uh, they take that to reduce the scaling. Uh, the problem with retinoids is that they're teratogenic, so they harm the unborn baby. Um, so in general, they're not taken by females of childbearing age. Obviously, in the case of X-linked ichthyosis, this does not apply because X-linked ichthyosis in general affects boys. Yeah. Okay. And is, is it similar to eczema in the sense, do you have flares where you can, it suddenly gets worse and you get it under control, or is it sort of the same all the way through? Um, in general, patients with X-linked ichthyosis, it would be worse in the winter. Right. And so, so yeah, so at times like, so, so for example, in the last week, it's got a bit colder. So from now on, Patients with ichthyosis, in general, the scaling would be worse in the winter, um, better in the summer. So similar to eczema in that sense, in, in the way the skin is reacting to a temperature change. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there may be several factors involved, uh, temperature change, humidity, and also in the summer, you get more vitamin D from the sun. Uh, and that may also have an effect on, on scaling and ichthyosis. So, so actually, I suppose that leads on to the question, does taking vitamin D, does that help at all? Um, vitamin D, I think, I think it's important. 
Um, I think if you've got a low uh, level of vitamin D, it can cause lots of problems. So, you know, you, you can be more prone to upper respiratory tract infections. I think there's evidence for that. You can get more bone pain. It's important for growth in children. Um, and in general, it's been shown that patients with more severe ichthyosis have, have lower levels of vitamin D. And also quite often, if people are, you know, if you've got ichthyosis and it's severe, uh, you may not want to show your skin to people. So people with ichthyosis quite often cover up, so they may not get, you know, as much sun on their skin to get to, to make uh, vitamin D that they, they need, basically. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so managing it, I think the main the message that you that came from that was obviously making sure you find a cream that suits you because presumably yeah. different creams suit you, mm -hmm. and they can be a mixture of um, OTs over the counter products, can they, and also prescription products. Yeah, I mean, you'd hope that most patients with ichthyosis would be able to get some, some items, so certainly a moisturiser and something that would help to remove move scale on prescription. Uh -huh. um, and also a soap sub substitute, ideally, because soap is drying to the skin. Uh, so it's in, in general, we prescribe um, something like uh, emulsifying ointment or aqueous cream or dermal to use instead of soap. Oh. Um, and I think that, that that's all helpful. Sometimes people opt to buy, buy things over the counter as well. You know, it, it, so for example, GPs in certain areas may only be allowed to prescribe certain creams. Uh, so that can, can you know, if, if a patient with ichthyosis hears that some new cream is really, really good, but they cannot get access to that cream, then they might decide to buy it over the counter. Oh. And I suppose it's one of those things, again, is making sure it's all very well having one cream, but be careful what you bath in or shower in and mm, shampoo, yeah. it's making sure that you have the full array of things with no perfume. Yes, that's very important as well. Yeah. All, all the sort of standard stuff. And then the other thing you said is obviously to do the sort of scrubbing, which, or, yeah, not scrubbing, what do you call it when you go like that? Exfoliation. That's so yeah, so some people use a loofah, some people use their hand, you know, can be very variable what people use. And, and that's a very important factor of managing it, is it? It, it, it can be if you've got severe scaling, yes. Yeah. Um, I think, yes, because we, we discussed about how, you know, accessing the right products and so I think the usual thing, as you said, is finding the one that suits your skin. Because what suits one person, we always know, doesn't suit. Is it also the same that you may be having a cream that's working fine, and then suddenly it, it just doesn't seem to be doing, keeping on top of it? Does that happen with ichthyosis? Occasionally. I mean, I, I think more often it happens that uh, patients really like a cream. So for example, there was a cream called Calmurid, which was very popular for ichthyosis. And the company that made Calmurid decided to stop producing it a couple of year, years ago. So first of all, the, they reduced the size of the pack from like 500 grams to 100 grams. And then they stopped producing it altogether. And um, the British Association of Dermatologists actually worked quite hard to get a different company to produce the same product uh. as a different name. And some patients are happy with the new product, but others say, oh, I wish I had Calmurid back. It was much better, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it seems to be always the way, doesn't it? Whatever it, what, whether it be a medication or a cosmetic or whatever it is, you mm. get it, you like it, and then it disappears. And then I suppose then it's the other sort of um, standard stuff, making sure that you're applying it in the correct way, the cream, you're applying it yeah. really, um, and applying the right amount, because I know that's one of the biggest things, is people are, don't necessarily put the right amount on, do they? 
Yes. Well, I think in general, I mean, I would just say put on enough to make the skin shiny, you know, so you, so I, I don't go with this, you know, apply X amount on your finger or, you know, two inches or whatever. I would just say, you know, apply enough to make the skin shiny. And one important point when you're applying creams is, is the creams should always be applied in the direction of hair growth. So in the case of the arms and the legs, you apply it downwards with da downward stroking rather than up and down. Because if you go up and down, the cream gets stuck in the hair follicles sometimes and you can get uh, little spots on the legs, for example, which is quite common. Mm. And it's all those handy, you know, to me, uh, those are the handy things that people really need to know because more often than not, a doctor would never even mention that they would just say put on the, the cream and it's understanding those very basic things that can make the difference mm -hmm. yeah. in, in how well the, the creams work. Um, Will, is there anything that, well I'm sure there is a load of things that we haven't mentioned but that are burning for you to tell us about? <laughs> <laughs> so I was just going to talk about some of the behavioural issues which we found. So we found that individuals with XLI are at slightly increased risk of uh, mood problems. So things like depression and anxiety disorders, potentially. Oh. Uh, and female carriers also seem to be at slightly increased risk of those conditions, including uh, postpartum depression. So after they've given birth. Oh, wow. Uh, so there could be lots of different reasons why that might be the case. There's lots of different reasons why people might be affected by these sorts of conditions. Uh, so it could be because of bullying, stigmatization because of the skin condition. It could be because these patients don't sleep very well because they're in pain or they're itching throughout the night. Or it could be some sort of intrinsic biological difference, which is making them vulnerable to these sorts of conditions. Uh, so some work we've done recently has suggested that XLI males, their mood problems, or they've self-reported that their mood problems are most strongly linked to bullying and stigmatization and also to uh, problems and difficulties with uh, applying the creams, which Adele's just been talking about. We've also found some evidence that um, XLI carriers and males with XLI have a reduced volume of a particular structure within the brain called the basal ganglia. So that's a structure which is important in mediating things like attention, like impulsivity, and also mood as well. So potentially that might be a complementary uh, biological explanation for why carriers and males with XLI might be at increased risk of some of these mood conditions. Mm. And we've talked uh, a lot, of, we've talked about, about the problems associated with XLI, but there's a cool paper which has just been published recently looking at what happens when you get rid of this steroid sulfatase gene in worms and when you inhibit the associated enzyme or protein in uh, rodents oh. and worms with deletions of steroid sulfatase so worm versions of xli seem to live much longer than oh. worms who don't have this steroid sulfatase gene mutated which if that also applies to humans it might be uh, something beneficial but, associated with the condition but, but it's not having xli it, it, that isn't a, it's not a, a life limiting thing though is it it doesn't seem to be life no. limiting thing now no. no. normal life expectancy and but if, you just if, get if worm stuff also translates to humans then it might be the case that individuals with xli actually live longer healthier yeah. lives than people without xli uh the rodent work mice and rats has suggested that if you inhibit the steroid sulfatase protein if you give a particular drug which inhibits that protein that might protect against uh, sort of mouse versions of alzheimer's disease as well so potentially individuals with XLI or carriers might be protected against some of these neurodegenerative conditions. So that's quite an exciting area of research, which we're hoping to follow up over the next couple of years. We've got a, just managed to get a mouse made which lacks the steroid sulfatase gene. So a mouse version of XLI, if you like. And we're looking at whether that mouse is protected against things like Alzheimer's disease and whether it lives longer than its litter mates. Oh, 
that'll be quite an exciting area of work over the next few years, I think. I think that's what's so exciting about research, isn't it? Because all these different things that you're learning at the same time, you start off with one hypothesis, but it then move, can move into other areas, as you've just said. And, you know, what, did, did we, were we saying that um, people with XLI can be prone to being on the spectrum of autism and ADHD and, and mm -hmm. things? Yeah, so there's some evidence that individuals with XLI might be at increased risk of autism and ADHD. So uh, rates of autism in males with XLI are probably around 10%, so one in 10 males with XLI, whereas in the general population, autism rates are about 1%, so one in 100 individuals. Uh, in terms of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, rates in males with XLI, probably between about 20 and 30%, based on the latest estimates. Uh, the general population rate in males is probably about 5%. And those sorts of conditions seem to be associated with the size of the deletion as well. So the larger the deletion you have, the more severe uh, neurodevelopmental phenotypes you might, uh, you might display. So there's a gene called neuroligin 4X, which is reasonably close to this steroid sulfatase gene. And if you have a large genetic deletion, which encompasses both steroid sulfatase and this neuroligin 4X gene, then oh. you're a highly increased likelihood of displaying some of these uh, neurodevelopmental problems, including autism, uh, global developmental delay, dyspraxia, et cetera. Yeah. And I'm sure for people who have children that are displaying those symptoms, who understand where it's coming from, makes it much easier, or I say much easier, but it's easier to understand how to move forward and how to manage the, you know, the, the, the concerns and issues that they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of parents of children who have some of these behavioural conditions, behavioural disorders, often feel guilty. They think that it might be their parenting or whatever, which is mm -hmm. responsible for some of these symptoms. And if you can show that it's probably likely to be at least partially underpinned by genetic factors which are beyond their control then I think that takes away some of the stigmatization which they might experience. And I think a lot of that will also take away some of many of the anxieties which can then um, I don't know it be um, having anxiety does or depression which is one of the things that you said if you're suffering with those does that actually make the skin condition itself worse? Is there any evidence for that? Mm, not as far as I'm aware. I don't know. In X linked, I think probably not. No. 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 I think if you have them, well, we've just shown that the severity of the skin condition doesn't seem to be strongly linked to yes. individuals' mood. So the fact that they've got a skin condition, regardless of how severe that skin condition is, is going to make them at greater risk of developing depression. Yeah. Mm. Gosh. I mean, I guess, um, Katrina, it's also important. So one advantage of being diagnosed early for a, a, a two-year-old boy, for example, with X-ray linked ichthyosis is that you can say to the parents, you know, that there is this association yeah. with autism or ADHD or learning problems and that they're aware of that so that if, if it happens, then they can get the appropriate help for the child at an early stage. Um, it may not happen at all. I mean, that's in general what I say. You know, if the child seems to be de be developing normally and is, you know, has started preschool at age three and is is fine, yeah. then you know I would generally try and be reassuring. But I would point out that you know, in in a percentage of of uh, ch children with X linked, this has been reported. So just be aware of that. So another point I think that's important to make is that higher levels of autism related traits and ADHD related traits as have been demonstrated in XLI, that's often viewed quite negatively, but mm. these sorts of traits can also be beneficial. So mm. higher levels of autism related traits are associated with uh, positive attributes like conscientiousness, attention to detail, uh, honesty, 
high levels of ADHD related traits associated with things like creativity, athleticism, mm -hmm. charisma, enthusiasm, entrepreneurship, all those sorts of things. So yeah. just because someone's got high levels of autism related traits or ADHD related traits, doesn't that's not a bad thing necessarily. That could be a flip side, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm just very conscious of um, time. So um, we've got a number of questions that are coming in. And I just want to say, if we don't get through the questions, we've actually taken a note of all of them so we can answer them later and send them out to people. So if you don't get answered, don't panic. We'll, we'll, we'll get some answers from, uh, from Will and Adele. So um, very quickly, a question for Dr. Dr. Davis. For Dr. Davis. Is um, development delayed known in XLI? I asked this for a mother of three of a three-year-old who has difficulties in knowing enough words for his age. Mm -hmm. So there does seem to be a link between developmental delay and other related conditions like autism and XLI. Obviously, at three years of age, it's quite difficult to tell what's developmental delay, what's normal, what's abnormal, etc. And there's a lot of variability across children for various reasons. But um, in general, yeah, XLI is associated with developmental delay. And as I said earlier, the larger the size of your genetic change, your genetic deletion, the more likely it is that you uh, develop things like global developmental delay, autism, some of these other neurodevelopmental problems. Okay, another one for you, Will. Do you know of any fine motor skill problems linked to XLI? So conditions like autism, ADHD, dyspraxia, fine motor skill problems often co-occur, they're comorbid with one another. So uh, because there's an increase in risk for these conditions, you also get an increased risk in dyspraxia, fine motor problems with XLI as well, yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip down one, because I think this one might be for Oh no, I was gonna say this one was for, I'm trying to pick one out for Adele. Not that I would know, but then it says, thank you, Dr. Davis. However, it says, my son and father have X-linked rather than topical rather than topical treatments, et cetera, to manage the symptoms. Will there be a treatment available for actually reducing the underlying deficiency either in tablet or topical form? And then they very kindly say, thank you for all the research you're doing in this area. So that was what I thought for Adele, but I think it's for you. Yeah. I think Adele can probably answer that better than I can, the gene therapy. I, I am not aware of any, uh, you know, gene therapy or topical gene ther therapy um, or replacing the protein type therapy in X-linked ichthyosis. But I think when we learn more about the biology of X-linked ichthyosis, that there may be other treatments that could be repurposed. So in other words, an existing treatment that might work for X-linked ichthyosis okay. in the future. Um, is this, is this scaling, does scaling get worse with age? Um, I would say in general, no. Uh, so, as in like, you know, as you went to your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, no. Um, in general, it appears in the first year of life, uh, X-linked, and uh, it might become more apparent over the next few years, but then it sort of remains stable. Uh, but I guess as people go through their lives and at various stages, so teenagers may not want to look after their skin so well, so, you know, some extra skin may accumulate them. Or as you get older, you may be less able to look after your skin. But my experience in general is that as people get older, uh, ichthyosis seems to get a little bit better, maybe. Okay. Um, among our members, there's, um, there's, so among our members, there's a girl with XLI with a gene from mom, from the mother and father. Does she have, does she has, does she have risk of complications? So I guess it depends on, on what the genetic defect she has uh -huh. is. Uh, but I would think that she, she probably will have the comma like opacities on the cornea, which are harmless. They do, don't affect your eyes at all. Uh -huh. um, she's female, so she won't have testes, so she won't have undescended testes. Uh -huh. 
um, I, I guess she may be uh, pr prone to the um, side effects that we, Will was talking about. Uh, so, so, for example, the autistic traits or whatever. But um, otherwise, you know, I think it, it'll be the same as in males. Yeah. But and, and I think, as you said earlier, Adele, you know, you don't know just because they may have these things, you don't know what's going to happen and everybody's different and you're just exactly a waiting game, isn't it, as they develop. Mm -hmm. so, one, um, one, issue, one, one of the main issues with female carriers and female who have mutations on both copies of their steroid open stage gene is this issue of delayed or prolonged labour during childbirth, which is mm. something that um, obstetricians need to be aware of if you're aware that you're a carrier. Um, potentially because female carriers tend to have lower levels of steroid sulfatase in the placenta and particularly if they're carrying babies who have XLI as well yeah. then uh, they have lower levels of estrogens produced by the placenta as a consequence of that estrogens are important in terms of cervical softening and cervical dilation so female carriers tend to experience um, delayed or prolonged labor which cannot in Severe mm. cases can result in emergency cesareans. But once again, that's an edu I mean, a lot of the things that we've been talking about are educational things that if you know about that these things could happen. So there's something what you've just said, Will. If you are pregnant, would your doctor tell you that? Or is that you know, is that general knowledge that you may have a longer pregnancy? So it's always good to tell when you go to to the hospital to have your baby, you tell them this. But would somebody know that? Uh, not necessarily, no. But if you're aware that you're a female carrier, you should tell your obstetricians, your doctors at an earlier stage as possible that it might be an issue when you're going through childbirth. That yeah. they, they might have to intervene if necessary. Yeah. Um, okay, Adele, what is the best pathway for someone to get a diagnosis? What does the, pe the parent or patient do if the GP is unwilling and is fobbing them off? <laughs> Um, you can complain to the CCG. Uh, you can complain to the CCG. Yeah. And actually, that is from, from Mandy. So I presume that's a question or that's a problem that people quite often face with, mm. with lots of diagnoses, isn't it? And I know that we always say to people, if you are not happy with what, you know, you feel that there's more to be said or be told to you, you, you just need to keep pressing, don't you? Mm albeit very hard. I mean, I, I, you know, I think if you keep pestering the GP as well, they probably will give in eventually. But some some GP practices have very strict, you know, sort of control of referrals. And there's somebody who scrutinizes all the referrals and says, you know, these are not appropriate or whatever. Mm. But but I think, you know, everybody with ichthyosis should get the opportunity to see a specialist. Some stage. Okay. But I'm just aware of time. If I just ask one, one more. My son is six with X-linked 1.69 MB. He has global development delay and verbal dyspraxia and very short stature. Is this a very large deletion to cause all these issues? So 1.69 megabases, I would say, is within the typical deletion range. So that, mm. those sorts of deletions aren't usually associated with severe problems um, things like short stature they're not usually associated with uh, but it's potential uh, or it's possible that this deletion has also disturbed genes either side of the deletion in some way and that might be what's resulting in these other sort of problems the short stature etc okay and um there's one other one that I think we can get in really, really quickly. Um, if you have ichthyosis, can you also have symptoms on those parts of your body that are not dry and scaly, e.g. elbow creases, armpits growing alongside the dry skin, almost like the skin can't cope with being softer or warm? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the elbow creases, armpits and groins are, are, are problem areas for everybody because they, they are areas that are a bit sweatier and you are more likely to get skin rashes of various types, just, you know, heat rashes or 
fungal infections or whatever in those areas anyway. So, you know, I think it, it, it's, um, yes, it's, it's, it's possible yeah. as the person describes. Actually, can I just sneak in another one? Because this is somebody very quickly. As a 43 year old who's lived with ichthyosis since birth, I've never been diagnosed with X linked, but the more I read, the more convinced I am that, I'd, that I have that rather than IV. Is there a benefit to being formally diagnosed, such as different treatments? If so, how would you advise about getting a formal diagnosis? Um, I would say if they're happy with their current treatment, then probably getting a formal diagnosis won't help their treatment. Mm. Um, in terms of getting a formal diagnosis, I think that would be important in terms of, of uh, inheritance within the family and also in terms of possible complications. So as Will uh, mentioned earlier, he's finding about heart complications in, in older people. Um, so I think to know that it's definitely X, uh, X linked um, as opposed to ichthyosis vulgaris would be good. Okay. Right. And I think the last one is not a question, it's more about um, saying that, and I've seen that I, as it's been flashing through, that swimming, swimming seems to help people. Mm -hmm. I think, bone pools. So on that note, um, I would like to say thank you very much. I'm very aware that this webinar was very, very technical. For me, it was very, very technical. And I hope I didn't sound or ask too many stupid questions because there's obviously a lot of people that are on here who do have the condition are very interested to, um, to learn more. And what I would say is please go to um, Ixiosis Support Group and I'm sure Mandy will be able to field more of the questions um, that, that people may have and please carry on all your great uh, research work because it sounds like there's a there's a lot to be found and a lot of benefit for many people with many different conditions as well through the research that you're you're both doing so thank, thank you very, very much for your time thanks for the invitation thanks. Thanks. thank you thanks, thanks. 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 bye bye